Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to IDA's. Oh, hi, Brittany. I'm sorry. I didn't wait for you to join me in time. <laughs> Hello. Um, welcome to IDA's fall screening series. Um, my name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the public programs and events manager at IDA. And um, I'm joining you today um, from Los Angeles, which is on the unceded land of the Tongva and Chumash people who have been stewards of this land for generations. Um, I'd like to thank um, IndieWire, who is our media, media sponsor for our fall screening series. And we wouldn't be able to bring this to you without the support of KCRW as well. Um, this is uh, going to be an amazing conversation around um, the film Boy State. We have over uh, 30 films, 35 screenings that we have this year uh, that are followed by Q&As. You can find out all the information at documentary.org slash screening series. Um, our films are available to our members. So if you're not a member, um, think about joining so you can get access to these great films. But um, you're not here to see me. So let me get off the screen. I'm gonna toss this over to um, our amazing moderator, Ann Thompson from IndieWire, who's going to be leading this conversation today. We'll just get her up here. My computer is being a little weird, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Technology, I think everyone's got a lot of patience for it right now, so. Slow, in slow motion. Welcome everybody. Um, this is uh, the panel for Boy State, which you just saw with the filmmakers, Amanda McBain and Jesse Moss. I look forward to getting into this with them and congratulating them for winning the Sundance Grand Jury Prize, which is a big deal for documentaries. Uh, and uh, let's bring them up. Let's talk to them. Hi guys. Hi, Anne. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's a good thing I'm not a filmmaker. That's all I can say. <laughs> Technologically challenged. Um, so I want to just start out with um, each of you talking about how you became, you know, not, not long line, but short sketch mm -hmm. of how you became nonfiction filmmakers and how you got together as filmmakers, as a team. Woo. Such a good question. I'm going to go way back to answer that one. Um, I did not actually go to film school. I didn't um, start out working in film. I was in the advertising, weirdly enough. And um, I think at some point I just recognized there wasn't enough human story in my day job and I was craving that. So I actually went to a summer program for film and got, got the bug and ended up uh, interning at a very small kind of uh, doc shop that made a lot for PBS and just absolutely fell in love with it and quickly recognized also this was back in the 90s that I could get my hand on a small mini DV video camera at that time and just go make my own film and that's actually around the same time that we met and we uh, went to a racetrack out on the end of Long Island and started filming a demolition derby race car driver at the time uh, that was interesting to us and uh, <laughs> and then made our first feature, a yeah. verite feature. Um, so that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, um, I used to work in politics out of college in Washington. I went to Washington with sort of big dreams and um, discovered pretty quickly that that wasn't the place I wanted to be. And actually that uh, 1994 was a huge year for documentary, Hoop Dreams and The War Room both came out. I saw them in theaters and I was just bowled over by the form. And I, I impulsively decided to quit my job in politics. I moved to New York and went to work for some documentary filmmakers, first Christine Choi and then Barbara Koppel. And that was my film education. And then I met Amanda and um, decided I would try to make direct cinema. Um, we did that together and we've been doing that now for 20 years and still inspired by the filmmakers I work for, by the work that drew me into documentary and. It's kind of fun to come full circle and now for the first time really make a film about politics, which I avoided actually for a <laughs> long time. At what point in your trajectory did you actually decide that you should get married? 
Oh. <laughs> took a while. It took a <laughs> <laughs> been a long courtship. <laughs> yeah. That's really that. We had to make yeah. a couple of movies before we could get married. Yeah. So. So, so you find working together and living together and all of that, yeah, you know, re reasonably a sane thing. Are, are you both? Yeah, we. I think we're lucky. We kind of found that in each other. Um, I think it's harder actually not to work together. Uh, there's many projects that we do separate, um, separately, and I think I find that a little bit harder just because I have a lot of opinions about the stuff that he's doing and but maybe don't have a role on it, but. We were actually introduced by a documentary filmmaker, Brett Morgan, yeah. so he, he, he sort of um, made the introduction. He said, you make documentary, you make documentary, you're both from the Bay Area, you guys should meet each other, and the rest is, is history. Um, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, every film is a kind of new collaboration for us, and we have such a great shorthand and a trust in each other, but we're sort of constantly defining and redefining the roles, and actually, Boy State is the first time that we've co-directed so in, in, in many respects, it's the same creative collaboration, but it's, it's, it's different. And I, I, think, um, I think one of the things I was thinking about at Sundance was like, why did it take so long for us to co-direct? Um, and I think what, one of the explanations is just practical and that you know, we, we also have kids and, and, and it was easier for me to, to leave and go into the field and whether it was North Dakota or other places. And, but, but I think those boundaries are sort of dissolving for us. And we've, we've entered a new phase, which is exciting and a long relationship to enter a new phase, both creatively and personally with this project. So do the roles break down in any particular kind of way? Uh, I'd say historically in so say with the overnighters or some of the films that were filmed over years and years. Um, Jesse was really one man banding uh, it uh, in the sense that it was just him in the field for, for a long period of time. And so I would then <laughs> watch the footage because he was like so pained by having filmed it that I don't think he could actually watch it. So I watched it. So we sort of had that relationship. And then together we wrote it with our editor, um, Jeff Gilbert, who, um, and that was true on this film as well. He was our editor. He's a longtime collaborator, longtime friend. We've known him also for 20 years. He also worked for Barbara Coffey. He also came to the racetrack in 1998. The, yeah, so. so this is like a, um, so I think historically I had a lot more of the, the producer in me and uh, that was true on Boys State. I think I kind of naturally, this was a much bigger crew. It was a crew of 30 people as opposed to one. Um, but, uh, and you tend to, I don't know, you tend to be a little more involved with the cinematographer in terms of the technical stuff, I think, than I am. But this one, we also have to wear, I mean, like all documentarians, we have to wear all the hats, usually. Um, I picked up a camera at some point, I picked up a sound boom. We just, you do what you have to do. Um, I've edited, you know, I've done it all, so. All right, so how did you come up with the idea? Why was this a good idea for a documentary? And um, how did you uh, get together with Davis Guggenheim mm -hmm. and get the financing? Um, well, I think we were uh, trying to understand the political division in our country after Trump's election and feeling like we were at um, this threshold moment where um, things had just gotten worse and we live in such a divided country. And as filmmakers, as Americans, trying to wrestle with this question of how did we get here and what is the future and looking for a, a framework to explore these questions that we had, not sort of knowing what the answers would be. And in that moment, discovering um, boy state uh, and girl state, but these programs that are unique and that they bring people together, young people who have different politics and they actually try to talk to each other in a room. And that seems like a very rare space in American life, increasingly so. And um, we thought, what, what would happen if we bring our camera there? Are, are, are they going to, as they had done in 2017, the boys in Texas voted to secede from the union. Were they gonna split apart into civil war, which is, you know, a very real question or or reconcile and come together i think that's the question we're all asking ourselves about our future and we thought boy state could be a kind of weather vane and point us in a direction we might be heading um, as far off the beaten path as it seems to be in the political conversation we sort of liked as storytellers that it was 
not the conventional way to look at politics. It was kind of playful, but potentially very serious. So uh, without knowing what we would find, we embarked on developing the project and then um, were introduced to, to Davis. Let's talk about that. Yeah, well, so Davis at the time, Concordia was still very new. Um, I, I think we might be their first feature length project um, that they took on uh, from the beat, from the get-go, right? And they were immediately receptive. We, we sent them a two-page treatment. Um, they recognized the sort of timeliness and the timelessness of this particular investigation. And, um, but what they wanted, which I think was very smart, is they really wanted us to have some people in mind who we were going to follow through this program because it happens so quickly. It's a week. It's one week. We had to capture the film in one week. And if, if, uh, if we didn't, so they really wanted us to, you know, quote unquote, cast beforehand. And that means whittling down, you know, 1,100 people to a handful that we would immerse ourselves with. Um, so that was a, uh, that was a chapter of making this film that was really difficult, but in the end, kind of one of the, it was the most important chapter, frankly. How uh, did you find, how many did you choose to, to follow and, and how did you make those decisions and how many, how many people did you have to catch up with as they succeeded? Um, we, we, I'd say about six, we ended up on day one. We had cameras with them going into the program. Two very quickly um, <laughs> didn't um, get their footing really. And one of them didn't feel comfortable, sort of like he got very self-conscious being in this, in this sort of environment with a camera on him. Um, and then we ended up picking up Renee uh, day two of the program when he stands up uh, and gives an extraordinary speech and it's just a no-brainer really that we would want him. Um, we were so moved by him that um, we asked him right away to be in the film. So we caught up with him uh, there and then Eddie much later um, also. But Stephen, Ben and Robert, we all met in casting. So three of the four characters in the film we met in advance and we knew that they were special we we yeah. uh, we met hundreds of boys we we went to their living rooms we went to american legion halls with our camera and we had not a script or a checklist but um a desire to find young men with different backgrounds different politics um racial diversity the program is not very diverse as you can see it's largely white largely conservative it's really important to find um, voices that were representative of that population, say Robert, but also Stephen, whose politics, you know, he's a Bernie supporter, he's uh, a, a Hispanic, he's um, from Houston, he, he's not like the others. And so... Um, anyway, <laughs> you must have been so thrilled that he did so well. Um, I mean, he could have died, you know, he, you must have been concerned, he could have bombed out at any time. He wasn't doing great at the beginning, right? Yeah. He, he was, um, that was a, I, that was one of the great surprises, frankly, for us, uh, is we knew he was grounded. We loved him. He had a real old soul quality and a kind of humble hum humility to him that was so profound, but, but we were just worried that wasn't going to resonate in the space we were in the sort of Lord of the Flies space we were walking into. And we also didn't know, we knew he was good one-on-one -on -one with retail politics. We didn't know whether he could stand up and give a speech. And frankly, I'm not even sure he knew whether he could give a speech. And you see in the process of that moment in the movie, we really are very close to him. You see that kind of, he's learning, oh, I can do this. I'm getting energy from the audience and I can do this and I can do this and I can do this. And it's a very, it's just one of those great, you know, exciting moments in nonfiction film where you recognize something very special is happening in front of you. I remember we, we showed the cut to uh, Davis and Concordia. We had a five hour cut. And <laughs> we weren't sure, you know, is this going to work? Are people going to connect with this? Even our funder and Davis leapt out of his chair, I think in that moment. And we thought, okay, we, 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 ha we have something here. Um, <laughs> but, but we knew, you know, that's exciting about unscripted filmmaking too. We love cinema verite. We felt like this was a big risk um, for us. Um, it always is, but you believe in your subjects. You, you sort of commit to going on this journey with them. 
you hope you'll be surprised. Um, you hope there'll be a story. And um, it, I like to say that there was plan A and there was the abyss and there's nothing in between. I mean, we would have made something work, but <laughs> the excitement was Stephen was a long shot. Um, yeah. And that to watch him go as far as he did um, was... Well, he uh, saves the movie from being too dark. Um, if yeah, you no. think. Um, and you know how divisive the politics are right now. And even some of your um, reviews have suggested that you leaned toward the light side more than, uh, and, and, and a kind of even handedness, which must have been a, a conscious choice on your part. I mean, I it's such an interesting film to share with people um, because I do think there's a, there's a bit of a Rorschach test in how people view it. You, of course, they bring their own emotions about politics or their own politics, or their own emotional uh, life at 17, right? Like everybody has very powerful feelings about all those things, their teenage years, uh, boys at the age of 17, all this stuff that people bring to watching our film, uh, which I think is all valid. And I think, you know, the kind of storytelling we do isn't particularly prescriptive. So we're not gonna say, you know, Stephen is the answer, nor are we gonna say that Ben is the answer. The fact is the answer is both. Both of those things exist in the country that we live in. And the question really is where, how, I want, I want for me watching this play out, it was very much uh, a questioning of myself of where is my cynicism and where is my hope? And which one, you know, it changes hourly. Obviously we're taking in a lot of darkness from the real world, uh, the real political world. And for us, this was very much for a reminder of the power of somebody like Stephen or the power of somebody uh, like Robert learning in this experience what doesn't work about playing to the cheap seats or learning from Ben as he does in the two years since this film has been made that you lose something when you, when you uh, win at all costs. There is a damaged body politic afterwards. And the question is, is can our country handle it? And that's what we're all dealing with right now. And to hear Ben talk about that, because we you know, talk almost every day, it's really powerful to hear that in this young kind of group of guys, as different as they are, to all have these takeaways. All right, so I was gonna ask you this later anyway, but uh, let's do it now. What, what happened to these guys and how much are you still in touch with them? And when did they see the movie and how did they react to the movie? Who was up at Sundance, for example? Um, everybody but Robert was at Sundance. He's at West Point, so he couldn't get away. I think it was in artillery training or something. Um, but, <laughs> but Stephen and Renee and Ben all came with their families. And um, Ben and, and Stephen had both seen a, a, a rough cut. And um, uh, uh, Ben in particular had a lot of feedback. He sent us a lot of notes. Um, I think that in his mind, you know, he was the protagonist. And I think seeing himself as the antagonist and that it wasn't what he called the Ben Feinstein hit reel was a real surprise and kind of the beginning of his moral, his, his journey since to kind of process his actions. Um, suddenly seeing Stephen rendered as a human being, see, seeing Renee's struggles to lead his party gave Ben a perspective that, that normal kind of lived experience doesn't provide. You don't, you know, he didn't, I just think he, that, so that triggered a, a conversation with him and we actually um, thought about his notes pretty seriously. I mean, I think it was our desire, part of the, the struggle of the film, it took a year to edit, a week to shoot and a year to edit was to kind of find the complexity of all of these young men and that they share screen time too. It's an ensemble cast, but we wanted to present them and, you know, we didn't want Ben to be sort of this simplistic villain. He, he's not, and, and, and we're really discovering that now. He's, he's, he's a complicated kid. And so kind of find, finding that in, in the storytelling was um, harder than we thought it would be. But um, so, so they, they, they all really are proud of the film and have been a big part of the conversation around the movie since its launch at Sundance. And um, I think it's been sort of, the, you know, as is true with documentary, I think that we've made in the past, they sort of live now in a different form and this conversation that we can have with all of them it, it, it sort of takes the narrative of the film into the real world um, and seeing them process politics now, they're all very active in politics in different ways. And, and so, um, and I think that they embody what we hoped to find, which was some version of civil discourse. Um, you know, we saw a lot of uncivil discourse at Boys State, you see it in the movie, but I think 
and these guys and their different politics, their different backgrounds are still participating in a conversation with us, us, which we find rewarding and encouraging. Yeah, I mean, and they're all sophomores in college, so they have that going on. But on in addition to that, um, you know, Robert's at West Point. He's in, he's serving in the military. Uh, Stephen is now working on a congressional campaign for Wendy Davis um, in Austin. So he's actually, you know, got a job in electoral politics. And um, Ben is, has doubled down on national security. He's um, majoring in, I forget, some, but anyway, he's learning Russian. Um, and then uh, Renee is um, no longer interested in electoral politics, recognizes that, that he just doesn't, at least, now at the age of 20, does not feel like he has that in him, but is incredibly committed to activism and organizing locally and BLM and, you know, um, understands his superpowers in that space, which he has uh, a lot of. So they're all very active. I think that to me, again, going back to the hopeful piece of this, they're all, you know, this, this notion that they, we hear a lot at Boy State of democracy is not a spectator sport. They all live that in a very, in, in different ways they believe in serving in their country. And I think that's really, for me, also a reminder of what's hopeful in this younger group. They're not so cynical that they just don't believe in any of it. So I want to go back to the sort of intense week of shooting this movie, which I find sort of horrifying to contemplate um, how, how much you had, you had like, what, six people on the ground with cameras and you had to orchestrate it every single day. You must, you must have been like going to war and having a battle plan. It, yeah. um, it was definitely a hurricane, right? And um, I think I said somewhere, like it was like we were the twin prop plane, you know, like we're a plane and we can stay in the sky, but we are going through this hurricane. And I, I don't know actually how we got what we got and we then we went home and we worked with what we got, but this was not the first um, kind of, kind of, it almost felt like a fiction film set um, more than a documentary film set in the sense that the crew was so massive mm -hmm. and that there was these major set pieces um, that we knew we needed to be there for these conventions, the National Convention, the Federalist Convention. Um, but unlike scripted, we did not know what was going to happen in those spaces. And so there was no blocking the room and there was no lighting the room. And there, you know, you had to kind of roll with whatever, you had to listen in a way that we had sort of extraordinary partnership with the, the cinematographers who you know, you just have to listen for, for what people are talking about, where the movement, the emotional movement in the room was going to be. And that is hard in a space like that, that is pure, as I said, like a hurricane or like pandemonium is so chaotic. So let's say you're in one of those big rooms with all of them sitting there and, and say Renee is making that speech. Where's, yeah. Where are you and where are the cameras? Um, there are two cameras on stage in, in that speech. Actually, Daniel Carter and Wolfgang Held are both kind of floating around Renee and simultaneously covering this kid who just, we didn't know Renee was a character at that moment. So you're hoping, and this is a really significant change for me, which is I'm used to shooting every frame of a film. And, and this is, I'm not, I wasn't operating camera in that moment. I did operate during some of Boy State, but there's a huge surrender of ego of like trusting you, your team to, to really essentially be the directors in that moment and to say, um, to be in the right place, to recognize that this kid is giving an extraordinary speech and then to cover the hell out of it and to make it as dynamic as anything could be and which they did and they're also simultaneously covering the audience and so um we might have two or three shooters in, in the room for one of these big events but then they, they also have to stay out of each other's way um and then there's we're plugged into the soundboard and i mean there's not an, an enormous crew in that you know we had a kind of a war room and you mentioned the military analogy it's a little bit like you know amanda is the, the general uh, and, and, um, it, and, but, um, you know, we wouldn't like throw 20 people into this room because I think you're still trying to preserve the intimate relationship between the DP and the subject. Like these crews were not six people crews that were following each of our characters. It was really like Martina Radwan, you know, you're, you're working with Ben Feinstein and you might have a sound recorder, or you might be working by yourself and you have to be comfortable working that way and comfortable shooting for 16 hours and comfortable shooting until your shoulder bleeds, One which literally, 
versions of you, yeah. avatars in a way. Yeah, I mean, avatars, I mean, I, they're all artists. And, and, you know, I don't know if you know this, Anne, but we worked with the Camera Collective, which is a group of cinematographers in New York. Um, it's Wolfgang, Held and, and Torsten Tilo, Claudia Rashke, Martina Radwan, Daniel Carter is kind of an honorary member. And they, we, we, we realized we needed something like this to achieve the movie. We needed a team of people who already know each other, who already have a creative shorthand and a trust in each other who could come and, and kind of share the vision for this film. And that's what Torsten, who was somebody I had worked with, I hadn't worked with the others really, Torsten and I discussed this plan and he said, let's do this. And um, so we set a look for the film, camera, lens, f-stop. And then we said, we're gonna trust you and you're gonna be paired with these characters. That makes sense. That, that's what I wanted to know. But then, but then in the editing room, and this was my other, that you were touching on this earlier, it, you had to be responsible for how you portrayed these, these mm -hmm. characters and try to be uh, fair to them. After you showed it to them and you took notes from them, did you edit the movie and did you edit it after Sundance? Did you tweak it? We did edit the movie after uh, sharing it with the subjects. Renee was the only one who didn't want to watch it beforehand. He really wanted to experience the premiere, um, you know, which is uh, like kind of in keeping with his character, but like I would be terrified to do that, but you know, he wanted it that way. Um, the rest of them, yeah, we, we kept working on the film and then um, we did not cut, we did not edit the film after Sundance. It was, it was done. It was um, well received. <laughs> Why would you? If, I could, if I could comment on that though, I think that in my experience, in our experience with documentary, you know, it's not really a subject object relationship. I mean, or, you know, it's much more collaborative. And I think you're asking, even though we, you know, we always retain editorial control, that's, non-negotiable, uh, the amount of intimacy and trust that you're asking for and receiving from your subjects, I think um, does inform the edit, both in sort of um, the obligations you have, uh, both to them, but also to your art form and to the truth, but also how you consider their feedback. And if, now, now not every filmmaker, I think, shares works in progress. But I, I think that, you know, if you think about what the end goal is for us, it's always to be able to share the work with your subjects on a stage like Sundance and then the ensuing conversation that could be a year or a lifetime um, because you share this journey with them. And I think getting to that point requires that you, you know, you sustain the relationship and that if they have concerns, you hear them. If you, sometimes you address them in ways that you think oh, don't betray your own, you know, obligations as an, as an artist and as a storyteller. And I think that's, that's the cinema verite form for me. Um, I know other filmmakers, you know, define those rules and those boundaries differently. Yeah, everyone does, everyone does. Um, so how did you come to make the decision about who would be your distributor and what went into that decision and, and how did that go? You ended up with Apple and A24 as a team. Yeah. And then, um, how did the pandemic uh, affect the rollout of, of the movie as uh, Sure. I, 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 my, my, my memory of Sundance is, well, first of all, Sundance is a little bit of a blur, but also just all the chapters since then have made that I know. month seem like 10 years ago. So um, it was an extraordinary time to, I mean, A, to share the film. We've never made a film that had laughs, really. <laughs> We've made a lot of very serious films. So to be in a movie theater with a lot of people and hearing laughter and hearing crying and, you know, just sort of the, that feeling of being in a room with people uh, watching your film for the first time was unlike anything I think I've experienced. Plus you're in very emotional because you're there with the subjects and my parents were there, my children were there, you know, Davis and his children. Were there. I mean, it was the whole thing was really wonderful. Um, I think that we then had, we had meetings. <laughs> this is like, stories we'd heard about Sundance but other people going through this were you you know late night deals in like um lodge you know like <laughs> cabins in the woods you know that had never happened to us so this was a very um very exciting journey of of meeting with various um potential distributors and and hearing their um re what resonated uh, uh, about the film with them i think that with apple what was so, and A24, I mean, 
A24 is an extraordinarily exciting company and um, their response to the film was along with Apple's, I just think that that combination of um, breadth and then also kind of the boutique um, understanding and the, very, the clarity of understanding of what our, what our film was, uh, was really appealing to us. So that, that's what happened in that meeting. And I wanted to say, I mean, thinking back to the, to the collaboration with Davis, what was so great when we were making the film is that they got on board really quickly and they financed the film really quickly because it was time sensitive. But then they gave us a lot of time, actually more time than we thought we needed to edit because they said, we thought we're, we're going to be done, you know, for Sundance 2019. And, and they said, I think we think you need more time. <laughs> and we're like, what do you mean? But we did need more yeah, time. Yeah. And we took almost a whole more nine, nine months, I think, beyond that. And I think this sort of combination of fast and slow was a testament to sort of their vision as a company and how they want to support filmmakers. And then I think going through the sort of um, vertigo of Sundance, having um, Davis and pe yeah. people around us who have been, have worked at a higher altitude, let's say, than we have was very grounding. It just felt very grounded and um, um, we could all make, a, you know, a smart decision that, you know, I, I think, I think having trust in other people around us, you know, you want stakeholders who, um, you know, who, who can help, help, help you navigate that. Um, so. I remember talking to Davis back in the day for Inconvenient Truth at Sundance. So he has been through it. Yeah. With Vice President Gore. Yeah. Those were, that was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so again, uh, the pandemic, uh, you know, you must have had certain plans that didn't quite come out the way you thought they would. Sure. And um, I think A24 was kind of amazing in, in their pivot. Um, we've been able to share the film, you know, this through Zoom, um, in, in, in probably with, in, in with many people and probably more often with the four guys in the film at the Q and A's just because they are very busy, but they've been able to attend many of these uh, Q and A's with us, and I think that the value of that, hearing them talk, frankly, is a little more interesting than us, just because their conversation is so. Uh, it, I, just hearing all four of them and in, in all of their difference uh, is really, I think, one of the great things about this. So there is this kind of, there is some upside to um, this journey. It's too bad that we can't be in theaters with people, but. Um, you know, I'm just very happy that we were in theaters at one point in January, and that was that was, that was great. I miss yeah. I miss the IDA gang. I miss you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Together over over at the landmark. Um, but uh, I know what you mean. Um, but you ended up uh, doing any theatrical at all, or just going straight to Apple? How we, did it we we did uh, uh, with Apple and A24 a really fun drive-in nationwide free screening in five markets. Um, I mean that seemed like that that was we launched the film in August, so you know month to month, week to week, the pandemic has sort of forced a new kind of reckoning with what's possible, and um, so that was what was possible. And, and in fact, we went to the drive-in in San Jose, um, and it was kind of magical experience and hearing people honk their horns, you know, when they like a movie, which is a drive-in tradition. It was something I'll never forget. Yeah. Um, and it was, the fact that it was free was really exciting. I mean, we're in a, a new and great phase of the film's distribution, which is with the support of Apple and A24, like it's, we've been showing on uh, to college, college classes, and we did Jill Lepore's class on democracy at Harvard. Uh, we were on her syllabus and, and to, you know, she sent us the homework, which was substantial. Amanda read it all, I read, read half of it. Um, but to really, you know, it's it's kind of a dream which to, to 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 be part of these conversations with young people. Also, to be um, a film that I think parents are watching with their kids has been really a lot of fun. And so that is something we can do. Um, oh, since we have kids too, it's it's travel is limited. But now in the virtual space, we can actually be in more places and be in more conversations than we might be able to do in the brick and mortar space of last year and um so i i don't know it's 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 really it's kind of a, a f i just it's fun to try to reach out and connect with young people around this film too and just see how what they make of uh, these young men 
in this political moment. Was it scary as you were doing this to recognize how many biases these kids had coming in that came from their upbringing and how few of them walked away having changed them? Or do you disagree with that? Um, I, do I disagree with that? I think there's a value to this program. I think there's a lot of things to question about the program. And I think there's also things to value about the program. And one of the values is that it does undeniably create a space where you are confronting the other, regardless of whether you walk away with a completely different idea about that, or you've been changed by that, or, but you do have a moment where you leave your home, leave your silo on Facebook, leave your whatever it is, and you do have to face to face with that other person. That to me is, um, is valuable. And, and as Renee says in the film, experience informs opinion. And so if you never have the experience of having to uh, talk to the other, whatever that other is for you, um, then you don't have to confront that. And I, I do, wonder, I can't speak to all the people, again, the 1,100 guys who went through this that particular year, but my anecdotal experience with the four people we went through this program with is that it was a kind of crucible and it really did change them in some way that was sort of, um, of again, of value. Now, that's not to say that there was a lot to be freaked out by in what we saw in the sense of like, where do people get their politics and why are they politicized at 17? And why is there indoctrination happening in these households and what media are they taking in? And is civil discourse even possible or is it even a good idea anymore? Are we at that place in America where you shouldn't listen to the other? And because the other is not also um, engaging in civil discourse, right? That's where we're at. So I, I think there's a lot to question and I think the whole idea of the project for me or one of the ideas was really to question my own my own um, my own biases I guess and walking into this what what was I expecting and also Renee says this is what every liberal needs that's what he felt and when he said it I remember filming it or being next to you know next to him when he said it and I was like yeah that's kind of how I feel in this moment like this is such a shock to my system, some of the conversation I'm hearing. Um, and then what? The question for me is, and then what do I do? Well, this is a valuable movie for that reason. Very valuable. I'm going to give you the last word, Jess, before we go out. <laughs> oh, wow. I don't want to end on a dark note. I'm, I'm a more hopeful person. But um, <laughs> I, I did want to say that one of the questions that we wanted to explore was like, to what extent are these young people internalizing the, the norms of discourse that they now see reflected in their national leadership? I won't name names, but, you know, and we see that with Ben and it's not bias, it's just, he, he, he says himself, you know, I took a page from the Trump playbook and, and, um, and we've talked about sort of the journey that he's been on since then, but I think that that is, um, that, that is different than bias. It's just like what's acceptable, um, what's culturally, politically acceptable. I, I think, um, you know, to, to counter that though is what, of course, what we saw in, in Stephen, which is somebody who, who, you know, leads with compassion and integrity and a, a kind of different way of being a boy, which is um, empathy and, and listening and, and to, to discover a, a different kind of boyhood than the you know, the, the sort of machismo that you see on display emerge, and not only to see it emerge in Stephen, but to see it find power and, and connection in this electorate, which does seem to be nothing like him. That, that was the sort of the counter to the negativity of, of the internalized, you know, bias uh, strategies that, that Ben deploys, I think. So, um, you know, I think we wanted a Hollywood ending, and but you know, it's documentary, and, and we've accepted that <laughs> You did. Um, it's true to the political struggle that, that, that you know, Stephen has never been deterred in his life and he will keep fighting and he is. And, yeah. and that, that makes us hopeful. All righty then. I like that. Okay. Thank you very much. I wish we could take questions from the IDA gang, but it ain't happening. So thank you so thank much. You.